Что мы сейчас делаем в ходе специальной военной операции? Мы защищаем наших людей, проживающих на наших исторических территориях. Вот если бы после, после развала Советского Союза, как Россия предлагала, выстраивали бы новые совершенно отношения в сфере безопасности в Европе, ничего подобного сегодняшнего бы не было. Просто учитывали бы наши интересы, о чем мы в сфере безопасности, о чем мы говорили из года в год, по сути, из десятилетия в десятилетие. Просто полное игнорирование. Прямо подошли прямо к нашим границам. Мы, что ли, двигались к границам тех стран, которые входили в блок НАТО? Мы же никого не трогали. К нам двигались. Мы, что ли, через океан перебрались к границам Северных Штатов? Нет, они к нам подходят и подошли вплотную. А мы что делаем? Только защищаем своих людей на наших исторических территориях. This is my video update on this. Friday, midday, March the 29th. Let's talk about some news. And let's start things off with an update on the Moscow terrorist attack. And the investigators, they put out a statement yesterday, the Russian investigating committee, they put out a statement where they said that the terrorists are linked to Ukraine nationalists and that they were paid with uh, cryptocurrency. The suspects in last week's Moscow terrorist attack were linked to Ukrainian nationalists, the Russian investigative committee stated on Thursday, Citing preliminary findings, the perpetrators had received significant sums of money from Ukraine, the law enforcement agency said. The investigators have obtained substantiated evidence that the suspected assailants received funding from Ukraine in the form of cryptocurrency, which was then used to prepare the terrorist attack. The statement read... Interesting. Very interesting. Cryptocurrency, huh? Connected to Ukraine nationalists. Yesterday, uh, Sam Bankman fried from uh, FD, FTX fame, cryptocurrency exchange FTX, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. I think the maximum that they were going for was something like 40 or 50 years, but he got 25 years. I don't bring up uh, Sam Bankman fried or FTX because they're, they're involved in this terrorist attack. I'm not saying that. I'm just bringing them up because at the time it was, I believe it was FTX that was involved in in uh, cryptocurrency donations or something, something like that with Ukraine. I remember covering this story uh, back when it was going on and uh, it was FTX that was, that was doing some, some work or charity work or donations with, uh, with Ukraine. And then the money got, got brought back, funneled back to, to the United States with uh with the democrat party something like that i you know i forgot the the story but but it was something along those lines and it was all done via cryptocurrency and i and i also remember um united 24 uh, covering united 24 which is the the ukraine uh the alensky regime crowdfunding site which also uh, collects cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, in donations. And they use the cryptocurrency to purchase uh, supplies and, and weapons and other things for, for the Ukraine military. I'm not saying any of this is connected to the terrorist attack. That's not what I'm, that's not what I'm saying. But, you know, there's, there is a, a history of, of using cryptocurrency. But uh, we'll see. Let's wait and see what the what more the investigative committee comes up with.
So the Russian publication uh, Baza, the media outlet Baza, they put out a report where they claim, according to anonymous sources in uh, in Russia, with uh, connected with the investigation, that the four terrorists were pumped up with drugs uh, before the the attack, and that they also had. Uh, had been scoping the place, uh, Crocus City Hall. They'd been scoping the, the place like three, three, four times, but uh, they were pumped up with drugs, according to this, this media outlet. So that was interesting news as well that came out yesterday. The plotters uh, scouted the site at least three times in the weeks leading up to the strike. News outlet Baza claims the Moscow terror attack suspects were on drugs, according to Baza. So Lavrov, he also weighed in on the, the terror attacks. And this follows up on Maria Zaharova's statement from yesterday, Peskov's statement from yesterday as well. And uh, now you have Lavrov and uh, all three of them are, are putting out statements talking about the, the Biden White House's statements insisting that uh, that Ukraine was not involved in any of this, and that uh, it was it was all ISIS, ISIS K. And here is what Lavrov said, and I quote: "The West is actively trying to convince everyone that this is the work of ISIS, and there is no longer any need to su to suspect anyone, especially Ukraine." Lavrov told Izvestia in a video interview published on Friday. They keep insisting that Kiev is not to blame, to the point where it's becoming obsessive and then Lavrov in this interview he he makes the important point he asks the important question of uh qui bono who benefits this is what he told Izvestia not just publicly but they also say in contacts through our diplomatic missions there is no need to suspect Ukraine but they never explain why he said from the standpoint of sound logic, answering the question, who benefits? We can't exclude Ukraine. We can't exclude Ukraine. Qui bono? Who benefits? And the U.S. is so obsessed, according to Lavrov, they're so obsessed with trying to convince the Russians that Ukraine had nothing to do with this, that they're even uh, working through diplomatic missions to try and convince the Russians that this was ISIS and had nothing to do with you had nothing to do with Ukraine. Interesting statements from the Russian foreign minister. And yesterday we also had the big New York Times article which covered the terrorist attack in Moscow with the title Why Russia's Vast Security Services Fell Short on deadly attack. The factors behind the failure to prevent a terrorist attack include a distrust of foreign intelligence, a focus on Ukraine, and a distracting political crackdown at home. So a focus on Ukraine, they say that the Putin administration is, is so hyper-focused on Ukraine that it just completely missed the ISIS uh, terrorist element. It, uh, it also says that, that uh, the, the political crackdown, the elections, the political crackdown from the Putin uh, administration is, is another reason why Russian intel was not able to, to prevent this terrorist attack. And, uh, and then the New York Times says what is considered to be the important part, the, the real, the real uh, purpose, the meat of this uh, article which is that the United States, they, they had information on this terrorist attack and uh, they didn't share all their info with Russia out of uh, distrust, out of distrust because of the conflict in Ukraine. The adversarial relationship between Washington and Moscow prevented U.S. officials from sharing any information about the plot beyond what was necessary. The New York Times said, the Americans 
reportedly held back information out of fear Russian authorities might learn their intelligence sources or methods. In the public warning on March 7th, the embassy said the threat was acute for the next 48 hours. The New York Times said it was unclear whether U.S. intelligence mistook the timing of the attack or the extremists delayed their plan upon seeing heightened security. I think we may actually know the answer to, to that question. The uh, March 7th, 48 hour warning, because we do know that Shaman was holding a concert um, at that uh, time period at the same venue. And uh, we know from various, uh, various posts on Twitter X from people that actually attended the Shaman concert that the security was super, super tight. Uh, very, very tough uh, security at that concert. And the thinking is that the terrorists, they saw the hide in security and they pushed the attack back. So we may, we may have the answer to that question from the New York Times. The New York Times gets, got this information once again from um, anonymous sources and anonymous officials. But, uh, you know, the, the fact that, that the United States, according to the New York Times, held back information from Russia does not look, uh, does not look good. This is going to anger a lot, of, uh, a lot of people in Russia. If, uh, if you believe this reporting from the New York Times, but there's no doubt that the NYT, by putting out this, uh, this story, they are absolutely trying to help the Biden White House distance itself from the, uh, the terrorist attacks. And, and I always thought that, or I was under the impression that when it came to fighting terrorism, even if, even if you were in, in a conflict, a proxy war, Keep in mind, the United States and the collective West always says that they're not at war with Russia. But even if you are in a proxy war with Russia, I was always under the, the impression that when it comes to fighting terrorism, then the entire international community cooperates. Because it's, it's that important to, to fight uh, terrorism, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, uh, etc. It seems like that's not the case if you go by this New York Times article. And, uh, and, and you know, the problem here, the problem with all of this is that, uh, you know, what the U.S. allegedly held back from Russia because of distrust and, and the fact that they are in, in a proxy conflict, Russian intel can now do the same when it comes to, to sharing information on on possible uh, terrorist activity with the United States. This is, this is the danger uh, of all of this. But you know, so something, something's gonna have to give here with all of these narratives that the Biden White House is trying to, to keep together. You know, they're, 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 they're trying to, to juggle uh, three, three, three narratives. Yeah, three narratives they're trying to, to keep in the air. Ukraine didn't do this. 100% Ukraine was not behind this. 100% this was ISIS. And 100% we, uh, we tried to warn you. Th th these are the narratives that they're trying to, to keep going. But, you know, as the investigation continues, as the Russians continue with their investigation, uh, I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to work out too well for, uh, for Ukraine. And who knows, maybe it's not going to work out too well for for the Biden White House either. They they should just stop. They should have never talked about this in the first place. It's my opinion that the Biden White House, when this terrorist attack happened, they shouldn't have mentioned ISIS. They should not have mentioned Ukraine. They should not have mentioned anything. They, they just should have kept it at, we condemn acts of terror. Our condolences go out to the, to the Russian people. And if they were really smart, if they were really cunning, like really smart and clever, they would, have, uh, they would have said that our intel agencies will contact the Russian intel agencies and we're going to work together to help Russia 
uh, get to the bottom of what's going on. That would have been a smart statement, and they, and they should have left it there. That should have been it. But they started talking ISIS. They started talking Ukraine has nothing to do with this. They started talking about uh, our warning, our 48-hour warning on March 7th. We've also given out war more warnings, uh, Karine Jean-Pierre said, though she doesn't want to say what these are. Uh, Peskov was asked about this New York Times article, and he said that, uh, asked whether the Russian authorities were aware of the U.S., were aware that the U.S. did not disclose full information on the incident beforehand. Peskov said, no, we are not aware of that, and suggested that reports citing unconfirmed sources, as in the case with the NYT, must be treated with great caution. Peskov is saying we were not aware of uh, of these this uh, this warning that held back information. We were not aware that they were holding back information, holding back sources and methods. I would be very very curious, interested to to find out. Not that we're going to get it, but it would be very very interesting to to find out exactly what, if anything, did did the U.S. share with the Russians. Um, not on March 7th, March 7th, 8th, that was 48 hours, but March 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, did they share anything with the Russians during that time uh, period? I wonder if, if Russia would, would dare to release any information if there was something shared with the U.S. during that time window. Probably not, but, but it would be interesting to, to see exactly what what the United States allegedly shared with, uh, with Russian authorities. The, the problem to, to all these narratives, what, what really bothers me about all these narratives is that the Biden White House and uh, the collective West mainstream media never talks about the, uh, the Renault heading towards the Ukraine border. They, they never mention it. They don't address it. They don't talk about it. The media in uh, in the White House during uh, any type during any press conferences with Kirby or with Karine Jean Pierre, they never ask they never ask uh, ask the White House about the the vehicle heading towards Ukraine. I was watching a press conference yesterday from uh, the State Department with Miller. From what I saw, the reporters did not touch the, the topic of the getaway car heading towards the border with Ukraine. They just don't talk about it. And, and that, that bothers me. That bothers me. Anyway, finally, in this update, we have Budanov's statement, the AI android military intel chief known as Budanov. And he was speaking at, at an event or giving an interview uh, the other day and he said and i quote by the way if we touched on this painful issue the terrorist attack even though this is the enemy i do not approve in principle of terrorist attacks against civilians this is coming from Budanov. i do not approve of terrorist attacks against civilians yeah Budanov is is worried he's also trying to distance himself from this terrorist attack why are you trying to distance yourself from this terrorist attack, Budanov? What are you worried about? Anyway, let's, uh, let's now talk about what is happening in Ukraine, in the conflict in Ukraine, because yesterday we had more uh, drone and missile strikes throughout all of, of Ukraine. And uh, the missile and drone strikes, they were targeting Ukraine's energy infrastructure and they uh they successfully hit destroyed much of ukraine's energy infrastructure in Kharkov from the missile strikes the the other day from what i understand you still have uh have blackouts and um they're they're not going to be able to fix the damage to their to their energy infrastructure to their uh electric uh, infrastructure anytime soon and uh and this is a big problem for the Aletsky regime in Kharkov but yesterday yesterday the the Russian military they they sent missiles 
pretty much everywhere, West Ukraine, uh, South and South Ukraine, all over. And uh, they were targeting the entirety of Ukraine's energy infrastructure. And this is going to, this is going to be a big, massive problem for the Olensky regime. And, and this time around, the Russians are not looking to, uh, to degrade Ukraine's energy infrastructure. They're looking to destroy it. The last time they were targeting Ukraine's uh, infrastructure in this way, it was, it was about degrading the energy infrastructure, but it was, it was even more about depleting Ukraine's air defense systems. This time around, the Russians are about destroying, completely destroying the, uh, the energy facilities, the electric uh, facilities in uh, Ukraine. And, you know, all the talk about about Ukraine becoming a, a producer of, uh, of weapons and, and building military uh, factories and, and weapons facilities. Yeah, that's forget about that. <laughs> forget about any of that, because there's no way that any type of uh, military production is going to take take place in Ukraine, especially with the with the energy uh, situation right now. I imagine, I imagine that sooner or later, the Alensky regime, if the blackouts continue, if they're unable to solve the problem of the blackouts, especially in Kharkiv, I imagine that they're going to have to uh, relocate a lot of uh, citizens from Kharkov to elsewhere. I imagine a lot of Ukrainians are going to try to make their way to, uh, to the EU, to Europe as well. This is going to get very expensive also for the for the collective West to, to try and keep the grid afloat, to try and repair the grid. If, if they can repair the grid, the infrastructure, I don't think they can. I think the Russians are doing so much damage to the infrastructure that I don't think it's going to be, uh, I don't think the West will be able to repair this, uh, this damage. Uh, of, of course, the, the big problem for the military, for the Ukraine military is that uh, they're not going to be able to to move troops and weapons to the front line, or they're going to have a lot of difficulty moving troops and weapons to the front line. Actually, yesterday, I think they also, I think the Russian military also hit hit an airfield in uh, West Ukraine as well. So, I mean, this is this is going to be causing a huge, a huge uh, problem, a huge headache for for an already battered. Uh, and defeated uh, Ukraine military. So uh, that's what's going on on the front line. Let me read you a tweet from Will Shriver. Many observers think the massive missile strikes in recent days are the Russians having an emotional vengeance reaction to the terror attack in Moscow nonsense. This is a long planned strategic air campaign. It is the prelude to a large scale Russian ground offensive. Yeah, a lot of analysts are thinking that this is just shaping the, the battlefield, setting things up for what will be um, a Russian offensive. I think at a minimum, at a minimum, at least in the Kharkov region, Russia is going to, uh, to create a buffer zone. I think that's going to happen at a minimum in the next uh, month or two. That's, in my opinion, that's, uh, that's coming, a buffer zone in Kharkov. Um, any other type of large-scale offensive, most likely, most likely, yes, but uh, I don't know. I can't, I can't predict that, but uh, we'll see. We will see. The Russians are definitely preparing for something big. That's the way it looks. Or maybe not, you know, maybe not. Maybe they're just trying to, to degrade uh, Ukraine, the leadership, the Alensky regime, to a point where it collapses. That's also a possibility. That that could be very possible. Anyway, we'll we'll wait and see what happens in the next month or two. Uh, Thomas Massey he put out a post on Twitter X saying our leadership is planning to attach Ukraine aid to an Israel aid bill. This is swampy. They want congressmen to be pressured by APAC and other Israel lobbyists to vote for a bill which predominantly funds Ukraine. It will also forfeit leverage we have to secure the border. I actually read an article from the New York Times 
the other day, which said that Speaker Johnson was at a private uh, donor event. And he actually told the, the Republican donors at this event that he will find a way to get money to Project Ukraine. So maybe Johnson is trying to, to put together some sort of aid, aid package, which allocates funds to Israel. And in that aid package, they also allocate a significant amount of money to, to Ukraine. They bundle it all together. Anyway, we'll see. That's an interesting tweet post from Thomas Massey. Now, let's discuss an interview from Donald Tusk, the prime minister of Poland, with La Republica. And Tusk said that war in Europe is a real threat and the EU is not ready. In his first interview with the international press since the victory in Warsaw, the Polish prime minister warns, we are in pre-war era. If Ukraine loses, nobody will be safe. Nobody will be safe, according to Donald Tusk. So let's centralize more power into the hands of Ursula and Michelle and Burrell and the technocrats and kleptocrats in Brussels. We need to, to centralize more power to the technocrats in Brussels. And uh, we need to get more money into the hands of the military industrial complex because we are not ready for a conflict with Russia. So we need to prepare. We are in a pre-war era. This is not the first time that Tusk has used these words. A pre-war era. Tusk is a, is a globalist, EU, EU globalist through and through. The blood in his veins is blue and gold, the colors of, of the European Union, not the blue and gold colors of the Ukraine flag. But uh, yeah, Tusk is going to look out for the best interests of the globalist class, the globalist elite and the European Union. And right now the European Union is on a mission. Their mission is to leverage the conflict in Ukraine to utilize the conflict in Ukraine. Never let, what is the phrase? Never let a crisis go to waste. Well, the European Union's in, in one hell of a, of a crisis. They're really in deep poo poo and, uh, and they're going to try to not let this thing go to waste. At least, at least at a minimum, the European Union is probably saying, you know, at a minimum we can, we can push to centralize more power, to Brussels and to get more money into the hands of the, of the MIC. At a minimum, that's what, uh, that's what they're looking to accomplish. So as, uh, as Ukraine collapses, as Project Ukraine falls apart, as the United States pulls away from Project Ukraine, at least the European Union can come out of this saying that they've, uh, they've gotten more, more money and more power into the, the globalist class at uh, EU headquarters. And nothing better than, uh, than the fear of Russia, the fear of the Putin to, uh, to scare the Europeans, the European citizens into going along with, uh, with the centralization of, uh, of power and money to Brussels. So Alensky, he, he gave an interview the other day to CBS News, and this was another one of, of Alensky's uh, outdoor interviews. He gave an outdoor interview to Fox News' Brett Baer about a month ago, a month and a half ago, and they pretty much uh, rolled out the, the same set, sitting, sitting on fold-out chairs outside with rubble around them, and uh, Alensky gave the interview to CBS News. And in this interview, Alensky told CBS that Ukraine is not ready for a Russian offensive. He said that Putin is going to definitely go to war with NATO. And then he said, uh, give me money. <laughs> That's pretty much, I'm summarizing the interview. There you have it. Ukraine's not ready to, to fight Russia. Uh, Putin's going to invade Europe. Uh, give me money. That was pretty much Alensky's interview. But let me read you. Let me read you some of his quotes in more detail. Uh, Alensky agreed that it would be very difficult to win the war while Putin remains in power. And he said that if Ukraine does not resist, then Kazakhstan will be next, then the Baltic countries, then Poland, then Germany, at least half of Germany. He also again 
reproached the United States for not providing assistance and noted that 80% of the money from this assistance remains in the States. So he is, he's angry with the U.S. because the U.S. is not giving him money. But, you know, the, the more interesting part to, to his statement is where he says that after Ukraine, if Ukraine does not resist, then Kazakhstan will be next. Huh? <laughs> what? How do you get Kazakhstan? <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand that. I, I don't know. I don't know what, what Alensky was doing before the, before the interview. I don't know what he was up to. But uh, I don't know, Kazakhstan now? I guess people in Kazakhstan should be worried about a Russian incursion, invasion into Kazakhstan. Okay, so Russia's going to go to Kazakhstan. They're going to go to Kazakhstan, and then they're going <laughs> to double back and then go to the Baltics, according to Alensky, then to Poland, and then to Germany, but but wait, wait, uh, Germany, everyone watching this from Germany, uh, don't worry. Russia's only going to gonna go to, into half of Germany. So, you know, just half, according to Olensky. <laughs> At least half of Germany, he said. Not, uh, not all of Germany, uh, just half of Germany. First, first Russia, first the Putin, go Kazakhstan. You see, first CBS News, he go Kazakhstan. And then he come back from Kazakhstan, he go to Baltic nations. Then from Baltic nations, he go Poland. And then he go Germany, but only half Germany. Not all Germany, half Germany. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's, that's the plan that uh, the Putin has in, in mind after Ukraine. Interesting. Interesting. Coming from the Churchillian uh, military strategic mastermind known as Volodymyr Zelensky. Alensky also said that Putin will fight with NATO. American soldiers will be forced to fight Russia if America does not help Ukraine, the only country that is now ready to fight against absolute evil. That's right. If, if he doesn't get money, if he doesn't get money and weapons, then Americans are going to have to fight Russia. After Russia goes after half of Germany. After they're done with half of Germany, then the Americans are going have to have to step in. You can hear the frogs, huh? A lot of frogs here. And then he, he said that Ukrainian armed forces will lose the conflict because they are not ready to defend themselves in the event of a major Russian offensive. Ukrainian troops have almost no artillery, said President Alensky. Where did all the money and artillery and tanks High Mars and Javelins and Javelinas and drones. Where did all of that go? The 200, 300, 400 billion. Where did all of that go, Oletsky? Now you're telling CBS you have no more. Did all of that get destroyed? Did all the money disappear? I don't think CBS asked that question. I don't think they were too interested in that question. All right, let's do some. Yeah, let's wrap this video up. Do some clown worlds here with our frogs. They're getting loud. What's going on, frogs? You're not happy with Olensky either, huh? Yeah, I understand. I understand, frogs. Uh, let's talk about this fundraiser in New York City Radio, Radio City Music Hall. In attendance at this fundraiser was... Obama, Bill Clinton, and Joe Biden. They were all at this fundraiser at Radio City Music Hall in New York City. From what I understand, the tickets went all the way up to $500,000. Up to $500,000. I'm sure there were cheaper, cheaper tickets, cheap seats. But uh, if you wanted to, to get front row and you wanted to hang out with Obama and Biden and Clinton, then you had to pay 500000 Stephen Colbert was, uh, was the host of this uh, fundraiser. And in attendance was also uh, Queen Latifah was there. And who else was there? I think Lizzo. Lizzo was also there. Wow. Lizzo. That's worth 500000 Lizzo, Queen Latifah, Colbert, and... 
Obama, Clinton, and Biden. Definitely worth the money. Here is what the Daily Mail is reporting because the event did not go off too, too smoothly. President Joe Biden's appearance at a $25 million Radio City Music Hall fundraiser with former President Obama Clinton descended into chaos as the trio of presidents being interviewed by Stephen Colbert got interrupted by protesters. A handful of pro-Palestinian protesters shouted down the president with one woman telling Biden, you have blood on your hands. As another loud guest warned of a nuclear war with Russia, you're out of your effing minds. The event was supposed to be a star-studded evening with major donors, with some tickets costing as much as $500,000. Meanwhile, former President Donald Trump also traveled to New York on Thursday to pay his respects at a wake for slain NYPD officer Jonathan Diller. How about them optics, huh? Biden, Clinton, Obama, Colbert. Queen Latifah, Lizzo at Radio City Music Hall, $500,000 for some tickets. Protesters shouting at, uh, at Biden, at the three presidents, you've got blood on your hands. You guys are effing crazy. And Trump is attending a wake for a fallen police officer, Jonathan Diller, paying his respects to a police officer. How about those optics? All right, let's do one more, one more story here. Forbes put out an article yesterday with the title, The British Challenger 2 is the wrong tank for Ukraine. The Challenger 2 is too heavy lacks protection and needs too much support. This is the article from David Axe on Forbes, published yesterday. The British, the British, British Challenger 2 tank is no good. It's no good. Wrong tank. Too heavy. Lacks protection. Needs too much support. I thought this was a wonder weapon. I thought the Challenger 2 tank was the wonder weapon. I guess not. But, you know, on... Uh, on May 31st, 2023, Forbes, once again, David Axe from Forbes, put out an article. This is right before the super duper spring summer counter offensive. Put out an article with the title, Ukraine's Challenger 2 tanks can plow right through Russian fortifications. Ukraine's Challenger 2 tank. So in May 2023, it was Ukraine's Challenger 2s when it was thought that they were gonna they were gonna plow right through Russian fortifications and the Russian military was gonna run away, run away, run away. <laughs> they thought the Challenger 2, the Ukraine Challenger 2, remember Annalena Baerbach? Where she was talking about Ukraine leopards. These aren't these aren't German leopards anymore. These are Ukraine leopards. Well, right before the counteroffensive, when the collective West was was excited about the, the the big the big counteroffensive, the big attack that was that was about to take place, and the destruction of the Russian military and the downfall of the Putin government. They were very excited about what was what was about to come. It was it was Ukraine's challengers. It was Ukraine's challenger tanks. The Ukrainian military with Ukraine's challengers and Ukraine's tanks. They were going to roll over. The Russians plow, plow right through, according to Forbes, the Russians. Now, today, fast forward to today, and uh, yeah, it's, it's British Challenger 2 tanks. They're no good. <laughs> no good. Too heavy. Too difficult to, to maintain. Not enough armor. No good. <laughs> Challenger 2 tanks. Nah, wrong tank. Wrong tank. High Mars. High Mars, wrong Javelins, wrong. Leopards, wrong. Soon to be F-16s, wrong. Wrong fighter jet for, for Ukraine. It's just the wrong fighter jet. Yeah. Anyway, that's the video, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Durant shop. Pick up some cool merch. Take care. <laughs>